Welcome, welcome to the uh, what is I think the eighth episode of our webinar series, um, Artificial Intelligence and Religion, um, co-organized by the Center for Religious Studies and the Center for Information and Communication Technology uh, of uh, Fondazione Bruno Kessler in Trento. Uh, our speaker today is uh, Robert Geraci. I will stick with the Italian pronunciation of uh, his uh, surname because I. <laughs> Uh, wouldn't know how to do it otherwise. Um, um, and uh, before we start and before I uh, give uh, a short introduction um, of Professor Gerachis, um, let me remind you that this uh, meeting will be recorded. So if you wish not to be recorded, please keep your um, uh, webcams and microphones switched off. Um, in any case, during the presentation, I would ask you to at least keep the, um, the microphone switched off so that we avoid feedback. So, um, Robert Gerachi, he's um, a professor and chair of religious studies at Manhattan College in uh, New York City. And he, is, he has authored um, a series, really, of, of books which are very, very uh, relevant to our webinar series on AI and religion starting, of course, with uh, Apocalyptic AI, Visions of Heaven in Robotics, Artificial Intelligence and Virtual Reality, published by Oxford University Press in 2010, Virtually Sacred, um, Myth and Meaning in the World of Warcraft and Second Life, Oxford University Press 2014, and Temples of Modernity, Nationalism, Hinduism and Transhumanism, in South Indian Science, uh, published with Lexington Books in 2018. I'm sure I'm uh, forgetting something here, but let me just mention these three uh, uh, books of uh, uh, Robert. Um, so the title of his talk today will be Technological Give and Take, Religions of AI in Indian Science and Engineering. Um, so, Robert, you will have about 25 to 30 minutes for your presentation. Then we will have 25 to 30 minutes for our discussion. Um, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for being here with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind invitation and um, for the wonderful introduction. I'm delighted to be um, working and with everyone at FBK again. Thank you, Isabella, for helping to manage all the logistics and all the rest of that. And most important for those of you, whether it's evening or morning, uh, thanks, thanks for coming to be here, part of the conversation today. I confess that I have been completely overwhelmed with certain COVID-related administrative details, and I have not practiced uh, talking from these notes. So Boris, if it looks like I'm gonna go long, please just, you know, shout out at me and tell me I need to, um, that I need to wrap it up. But what I want to do today is I want to argue that Indians, both specifically in the tech sphere and outside that, uh, are increasingly engaging with Western transhumanist narratives about AI, and that they're working toward reconstructing those narratives in ways that might become globally re uh, important. Uh, and in particular, or, or along with that, that we ought to provincialize the narratives about AI. Currently, Euro-American views purport to be the views about the future and about the importance of AI. Uh, but in doing so, they, they're engaging in a kind of world building that would be better completed with a wider scope of cultural interaction. Now, my notes, by the way, are also on the computer. So I have to kind of swap back and forth to um, move around. Hopefully, it won't be too awkward. Uh, now, as Inc. and Prol pointed out in November, narratives about AI are significant. Uh, and, you know, they tell us about what we're trying to do in our technological deployment. In an essay recently published in Nature Machine Intelligence, Stephen Cave and Conte de Hall note both the significance of fictional and non-fictional depictions of AI in science and in pop culture but also the important ways in which both fiction and nonfiction visions of AI inevitably fail to sever dreams of human salvation from human disenfranchisement and damnation. So we have these really compelling narratives, right, both fiction and nonfiction, and they're, they're kind of constantly wrestling with what is the future going to look like for us? And is it going to be terrible or is it going to be wonderful? Uh, of course, we all know kind of from prior experience, it's more likely to be somewhere in the middle than either one of those ends. 
but these these narratives are compelling. And for more than a decade now, when I've been thinking about AI narratives, I'm kind of constantly reminded of Borges's amazing story, Plan Ukbar Orbis Tertius, um, which if you haven't read this short story, you really should, it's, it's beautiful and brilliant. But essentially what happens in that narrative um, is uh, a story about people who create a fictional world uh, by writing about it. And their writing about the fictional world comes to take over the world in which they live, such that the world in which they live becomes like the world they are writing about. So they're doing a kind of myth building that is going to actually reconstruct the world around them. And I think that's an important analogy, not just to things, you know, for Borges, it might've been important like literary authorship, but to um, what we're looking at when we talk about technology. You know, a lot of people who talk about technology speak in, in words like future casting and, and so forth, but really they're not, they're not predicting the future. They're actively trying to build it, right? The world that they describe is the world that they are trying to construct, but not all such narratives construct the same views of the present or of the future. Jennifer Robertson in her uh, lovely book about um, Japanese robotics points out that the singularity as a concept is unpopular in Japan. Just as like one little example, right? Um, but in Japan also visions of the future are being built. Selma Sabanovich argues that Japan as a robot nation is produced actively by scientists, engineers, and policymakers. There's nothing inherently ro robot nation-y about Japan. It's a project, right? It's something that's being constructed. So when we look at kind of the, the global environment and conversations about AI, and in my particular you know, intersection and what we're doing here with all these lectures here uh, hosted by FBK, that we're looking at religion and AI, but what other kinds of futures are being described and designed, right? Because that, how we, how we describe those futures will impact what comes about, even though it's unquestionably the case that the future is not gonna look like any of those particular narratives, right? You know, if you, people sometimes look at science fiction and they, they, they cherry pick an example and they're like, look, so-and-so predicted the future. Uh, but by and large, if you just gathered up all the science fiction predictions about the future, it would be a minuscule, amount that actually had come true. So it's not really the case that what we're looking at is definite um, uh, or is definition of the future so much as pushing us towards certain kinds of futures. Uh, and I've been engaged with US visions of artificial intelligence for a long while now uh, and have been working on those that either appear or don't appear in India since about 2012. So this talk is kind of, um, a mix in between those two areas. I'm just gonna go grab another slide here. Uh, so my general approach to the intersection of religion and AI has revolved around uh, what Boris mentioned in my the first book I published called Apocalyptic AI, uh, in which I've kind of talked about the rise of transhumanism uh, in, you know, specifically from kind of like 19, I don't want to get into dates, <laughs> 20th century rise of transhumanism and the intersection of that with the rise of artificial intelligence technologies. And specifically in a running theme in my work has been these ideas that there will be a singularity in history as machine intelligence explodes. You know, these ideas track back to Vannevar Bush, to Irving Good. Um, they track forward to, of course, Ray Kurzweil, but also more recent people like Max Tegmark and Elon Musk and so forth. Uh, so I've been interested in this idea of singularity and the intelligence explosion, uh, but also very particularly the idea of mind uploading as a form of salvation. That was actually what first made me think that there was something religious happening in pop science books about AI is I picked up Hans Moravec's book, Mind Children, and he talked about uploading people's minds and making them immortal. And that struck me as about as religious of an idea as you can get. Um, but, you know, we see this stuff, related ideas in science fiction going all the way back to kind of 
ideas of disembodied immortality that go back to George Bernard Shaw in the early 20th century to people like Arthur Clarke in the middle of the 20th century to much more recent people like Richard Morgan, who's altered carbon, his, who's altered carbon books from the early 2000s are now a, were a big hit on, on um, either Netflix or Amazon. I can't remember which, um, but we're seeing all these other streaming shows in science fiction they talk about mind uploading and so forth. Uh, and Ernest Klein's best-selling Ready Player series. But in addition to science fiction, you're seeing this stuff in popular science um, from George Martin in the early 1970s and Hans Moravec in the 1970s, and then again in the 80s and 90s, and Ray Kurzweil and recent incarnations in Yuval Harari's book, um, Sapiens and uh, the popular work of Michio Kaku and, and others, right? So I'm happy to field questions about kind of what I think the apocalyptic AI narrative is doing, uh, but I don't want to dwell on it because then we would be dwelling on old things instead of new things. Uh, uh, just so it's clear, my kind of ethnographic approach to this began in 2007 when I was at the Carnegie Mellon University Robotics Institute over the summer. Uh, they were very gracious hosts and allowed a very strange interloper into their midst. Uh, I then proceeded to do a lot of ethnographic work online, both in online worlds and in discussion forums and so forth. And that was really what ended up kind of producing most of what went into that, that second book that, that Boris had mentioned. In 2012 to 13, and then again in 2018 to 19, I spent five months in each of those uh, periods in Bangalore the first time hosted by the Indian Institute of Science and the second time hosted by the National Institute of Advanced Studies. And so during those times, I was talking to scientists and engineers, both in industry and in uh, academia and in hacker culture. Technically, the, the, second thing, the second time I was in Bangalore, my main project was actually about hand loom weaving, but I was still talking to folks about some of these other technological issues. And part of what's been really valuable for me about the ethnographic side is it has helped me learn to do my work much, much better, right? I owe a, a significant debt to all the folks I lived with and worked with in India for sharing a different lived experience with me. It wasn't just the stuff you might read in books or in Wired magazine or what have you. It was what people were living with day in and day out. And um, Syed Mustafa Ali, who uh, wrote a first presented, but then I... I ran a colloquium for Zygon, the journal Zygon, in which we published his essay, but it's a criticism of me. <laughs> and um, the, the way in which race never entered into any of the conversations that I had published up until that point, because it really wasn't until I'd been in India that I started getting a, a much more, um, uh, I think, profound approach to what I was trying to do, right? At, at any rate, a more global one. And it was one that helps kind of provincialize the experience of the Western technological elite, right? Much akin uh, to Chakrabarty's book, Provincializing Europe. But the, the idea that the Western, you know, the Silicon Valley elite, they may have the most money in the, in the game and they may have the loudest voices, but they're only one set of voices. Right? And there are lots of other kinds of voices, whether those voices are from women, for example, because most of those Silicon Valley folks who are talking loudly are men, um, but whether those are women or people from India or Japan or China or anywhere else, right? We have, to, we have to take that Silicon Valley voice and instead of making it the voice, it's a voice, right? And the whiteness of AI as it stands is remarkable, right? The, you can see on the picture that I have here, that was just... That's what, those are the, all the first images that come up, aside from the sponsored ones. When you say you just want robot, images of robot, and you'll notice how profoundly white that page is, right? Um, and Ali has argued that transhumanism in general is a form of white crisis, a response to the rising voices of non-white communities and an effort to maintain white supremacy. Um, going back to Stephen Cave and Kanta de Hall, in another essay of those, um, they, they, engage the portrayal of AI as white and how it excludes non-whites from futurist imaginary and it affirms social prejudices against those communities. So like that's a real problem, right? That has to be kind of worked through. If what we're trying to do is build futures, we need to build good futures, right? 
Um, and, you know, Yard and Cats is a new book that I haven't looked at yet on AI and the logic of white supremacy. So I kind of, I look forward to seeing that. But there are, there are shifts, right? Um, Philip Butler's Black Transhuman Liberation Theology doesn't really talk so much about singularity and mind uploading, but it is an effort to take kind of transhumanist thinking and say, how does this become a new tool to make things better for, for people who are oppressed, right? So somewhere in this kind of narrative, we have Indian transhumanism, right? Uh, if, it, if it exists, it fits somewhere in this ideological marketplace. Um, now, there wasn't, as far as I can find, very much going on in the 20th century in India about transhumanism. And I've delved back in some archival stuff. And this, which kind of interesting for me, and I talk about this, I have a new book coming out. Um, I think it's going to be called Futures of AI. I think that's the agreed on title. And that's coming out this coming year um, with Oxford in India. And then I don't know when it like deploys elsewhere. Um, but John Burton Sanders Haldane, JBS Haldane, who's one of the kind of key figures in what becomes Euro-American transhumanism, he moved to India in the 1950s. He spent the last few years of his life there. Um, and so despite his presence there, and despite of clear reference to Julian Huxley, people in India were aware of Julian Huxley, whom most of the people, you know, probably who are here today know that Julian Huxley coined the term transhumanism and that kind of thing. Um, but so despite the fact that there were people aware of Huxley, aware of Haldane, Haldane was in fact quite popular in India uh, for his pop science writings. But at this point, they weren't about transhumanism. They were, you know, explaining chemistry or whatever else. Um, but despite the presence of Haldane and awareness of Huxley, there wasn't a whole lot going on in 20th century in terms of India and futurist speculation. Um, now, in the 21st century, we're going to get to is there's there's definitely shifting there, right? And some scholars have tried to engage that. The very first was by uh, Christopher Chapel Key, but his essays, while being the first and therefore in some sense, I guess, worth looking at, uh, don't offer a lot of grist for the mill. But Adam Bubin, in uh, an essay in Philosophy East and West, he argued uh, that Hindu goals of moksha or release make transhumanism a kind of unlikely thing in the Indian context. Uh, I don't, I, I, even though I like his essay, I don't actually agree with him because the same could be said about Christian views of salvation. But the reality of it is whatever your views are about what's going to happen after you die, most people are not eager to die. You know, it doesn't matter what promises have been rendered. So in that sense, a theological doctrine is not necessarily much of a stumbling block. Um, and on the ground, there are already folks interested in transhumanism in India, and that community is growing, right? So um, I think the philosophical side uh, has to give way to the, um, you know, anthropological side, because there are extant communities in India, things, you know, and they're small. They're all small. India Awakens, India Future Society. My very favorite is Singularity Cafe, which is in Chennai. Um, and so I featured some of this kind of stuff in Temples of Modernity. And again, in that, and, and I talk about it in greater length uh, in this, this next book that's going to come out. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about this kind of rapid growth in transhumanist thinking in India. Because when I was there in 2013, that was something that I was, uh, that was part of my interview process, right? Was that most people didn't bring up someone like Ray Kurzweil, um, but, you know, within academia and industry, many people had heard of those kinds of ideas, right? Um, but the academics almost universally rejected the ideas of mind uploading and singularity and transcendently smart machines and all the rest of that. You know, one roboticist told me, quote, we're not interested in immortality. Live forever? That's a crazy idea. First of all, our spiritual background does not encourage these ideas. We are not really excited in having a copy of another machine like us, unquote. Uh, a biotech professor told me that futurism, quote, hasn't really penetrated into anything meaningful or substantial, unquote. Uh, but in industry, things were a little more, um, there's a little more in interest, especially among the young, right? And, um, you know, there, <laughs> one funny thing an academic told me is he said, mind the uploading, quote, might be popular in industry circles, 
but I think maybe with the common man and with the profound thinkers, soul probably is immortal, unquote. So like a little bit interesting that he was willing to say, oh, you know, those industry people, they might, you know, entertain these kind of silly ideas or what have you. Uh, and, but people in the industry told me things that like in the elite 10% is where you'll quote, hit up these type of ideas about the singularity, people who look beyond their own little pond or lake or whatever, who peek beyond the all and see the wall and see what's possible, unquote, right? Um, or another IT company owner who said, quote, we hear now and then about these, but we lack the ecosystem that we really bring it out infrastructure grants, the media, or the kind of supporting systems. I don't think they exist now, unquote. So one of the things that struck me in 2013 was really that last idea that the ecosystem wasn't really present. And at the time, I started telling people that I thought smartphones were going to really change everything in that regard. Uh, because smartphones were were on were on an actual exponential curve in terms of their population density, and the thing is, is they bring so much of global conversation to one person's space. Uh, by 2019, um, transhumanism was more in the air in the scientific and tech communities that I went to. I recently did have a chat with a computer scientist from India who said that people aren't really discussing these, these kinds of things. Um, so it's definitely community, like some communities are talking more than others, right? Um, but for an example, you know, I mentioned my, I was affiliated with the, with NIOS, the National Institute of Advanced Studies. And so I still attend, you know, some of their things online and, this summer, there was a Facets of AI workshop in July, and out of the like four speakers or something, two of them mentioned, two of the speakers mentioned the singularity, right? So it is coming up in those conversations. And NEOS is actually hosting a talk on posthumanism this coming Friday. So my own experience is that these things are kind of increasingly present in Indian science and engineering circles, even if the, the progress is at you know, I, progress is the wrong word because I'm not trying to put a moral value on increasing transhumanism. Um, but even as the, the the growth is perhaps limited, you know, you could go back to someone like Ray Kurzweil and they tell you, of course it's limited. It's exponential. It, it looks small at first, but then it takes off. I am not promising an exponential growth in uh, transhumanist thinking. I'm the son of an economist, so I don't believe in exponential growth. Uh, now, you also see this, this isn't just in terms of like me attending lectures, you see this in uh, textually. There was in the popular science magazine, India Dream 2047, which is an Indian pop science magazine, uh, an essay about two years ago, I think, by Govind Bhattacharjee, uh, who wrote, there is still a long way to replicate human intelligence, but it may usher in an era in which there will be probably no such thing as pure human intelligence because all humans will be a combination of biological and non-biological systems, which will constitute integral parts of our physical bodies, vastly expanding and extending their capabilities. Humans and machines will merge together to create a human machine civilization. And then he concludes, and he mentions, he talks about Kurzweil and a number of other people all through this. So he's clearly familiar with the, that, that Silicon Valley conversation. He concludes that humans and machines will merge to constitute a unified entity where the distinction between man and machines will be obliterated. The question itself, whether machines can have consciousness, will then become meaningless. Um, to, to tack on a little bit of my own kind of ethnographic work, um, the, the, I've spoken at some length with the creator of Singularity Cafe. He's a really great guy. I look forward to, to going there next time I'm in Chennai. Um, but he says, we'll be happy. We will, we will have accomplished our destiny by creating super intelligence. Uh, he also notes that Vishnu, he himself is not, uh, he, I think, is an atheist, but he believes that for Hindus, the belief that Vishnu, uh, he said, he said Vishnu's, many people believe that Vishnu is going to return as Kalki, and many people would say AI is Kalki. Kalki is the avatar of Vishnu who's to come at the end of this degenerate age and um, inaugurate a new age. At a lecture I gave, I had a student raise a hand and say, what is God right now? So it's a very subjective thing about Kalki, the day of Kalki. So my suspicion is AI is Kalki. I mean, a truly artificial intelligent being is Kalki maybe. Uh, and it's not just techies because I recently had an absolutely wonderful conversation with Holly Walters, whose ethnographic work is in 
Nepal mostly. Uh, and she notes that among, she told me that among sadhus in, in Nepal, there were people, there was at least one person who made that same connection about Kalki and um, the, and, uh, 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 and AI, right? So really remarkable stuff. And, it, and it's kind of broadly spread around. Things are perhaps changing in India. And I want to make it clear, this isn't like, George Basala's idea of diffusion that everything starts at like kind of the, the, the center and then it moves out to the periphery. Rather, we're looking at all kinds of mixed up messy networks where ideas are traveling all around. But if we look at kind of classical anthropology, uh, E.E. Evans Pritchard told us that religious ideas travel, but they don't always mean the same thing in a new community. And I think that's an important uh, part of the, the thing to keep in mind, right? Uh, E.B. Tyler talked about survivals, processes, customs, opinions, and so forth, which have been carried on by force of habit into a new state of society different from that which they had their original home. So even as we're looking at kind of increasing transhumanism in India, we should be anticipating um, that some things are going to survive from prior, prior states and they're going to be negotiated and mediated and a new thing will kind of happen. And we're already seeing kind of globally some intercultural intersections between religion and AI. This includes the Turing Church, um, which was founded by Giulio Prisco, Italian physicist, and he's kind of well connected in a variety of Euro-American transhumanist communities um, and has recently started connecting with India in the last couple of years. The Avatar 2045 project in Russia has a, a Hindu guru who's kind of like affiliated. I'm quite, quite I don't, I, I've only read loosely about that in um, Anya Bernstein's book on Russian immortalists. So I don't know a heck of a lot about it, but we're already kind of starting to see that thing happen, right? Going back to Borges, what he suggests is that the future is something that can be designed. His is a statement about authorial intent and the power of literature, but I take it to be much broader than that. I take it to mean that the world is something that we can actively pursue um, its, its construction and its evolution, right? It won't come out just how we thought it would, but we can still work on that, right? And for singularity advocates, these people who believe that exponential growth in, in computation means we're going to have transcendent godlike machines and mind uploading and all the rest of that jazz. For them, they believe the future is actually closed, right? That, that they already have seen the future, that, that that's it. But what's really happening is that they're trying to close the future through their own advocacy, through print and online capitalism, basically, right? It's like Benedict Anderson's amazing book on uh, print capitalism, the imagined communities, right? Except in this case, it's an imagined future. Um, suddenly a tweet from Elon Musk or a book from Max Tegmark are like gonna control the destiny of humankind. Uh, but I'd like to push for the idea that the future is open, um, you know, and and following Banu Subramaniam that we, that, that we should, um, broaden the political use of science, right? That instead of letting science try to narrowly be defined in ways that control and constrain our futures, we ought to be thinking about how the open borders of communication um, of ideas about science and technology mean we can start laying out possible futures and working to pursue human and maybe artificial intelligent flourishing. Thank you guys very much. Thank you very much, Robert, for this um, very, very interesting talk. Um, we now have uh, about half an hour of um, time for, for discussion. So if you have questions, please use the chat to tell me so, and I will keep the list. Maybe I can start with a, um, with a, it's a, a mix of a comment and, and a question, really. Um, going back to the to the beginning of your talk robert um when you when you read um public debates in the media in um in books in uh in all kinds of of contexts really about ai the impression is that one gets very quickly is uh, that there are th certain things which cannot be said uh, which like people stop short of asking certain questions stop short of saying certain things um, 
Now I'm mentioning this not because I'm uh, not because I'm convinced that um, these things that do not get said are necessarily correct, but I, I'm saying this because I think that they should be said. And you make this very nice distinction between uh, predicting the future and and building world building, make world making ways of world making, and uh, predicting and uh, ideologically. Uh, these two things are not kept separate at all in in uh, in these debates. So, for instance, what I what I what am I thinking of? Um, certain questions regarding, um, for instance, the spread of AI technologies into certain uh, areas of of life. I mean, hardly anyone really says things like, "Do we really want these technologies?" to be applied, for instance, in, let's say, uh, 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 yeah, when it comes to facial recognition and these things, that, that's, that's a debated topic. But when, when people tell us that these um, technologies are um, revolutionizing your lives, our lives, and this is going to happen, I mean, they talk from a, against the background of a kind of deterministic idea about what's going to happen there. So. Uh, my, my impression is that um, certain things, certain radical questions, which are not really deep or any, in any kind, uh, in any way um, difficult, do not get asked. For instance, the one, how much, how much do we want these technologies to penetrate into our lives? So then, of course, people will say, well, this is, don't be ridiculous, this is going to happen anyway. But that's never a good response. Yeah. Yeah. That's never a good response. So maybe you can um, say a bit more about this distinction between... Um, yeah, predicting and world making. That, that, that I found this very interesting. Yeah. Well, I actually take the aura of in inevitability that so many people keep pushing, right? That you're speaking to. Someone goes, oh, it's going to happen anyway, or this is just the future. Uh, that to me is its own kind of quasi religious idea, right? That traces from, you know, views of divine providence and so forth. This is just what the future is going to look like, doesn't matter whether you like it or not. It's doing, it's doing this thing. The world is doing a thing, right? And if you actually, if you read, for, before I come back to those kind of more specific political questions, if you go to the kind of pop science books that people like Moravec or Kurzweil or whatever else, you know, what they're going to write, they all make up some transcendent reason why that's going to happen. For Moravec, it's evolution. As though evolution as we define it in biology has anything whatsoever to do with silicon chips, right? It, it doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, but he's going to go, the, evolution is bringing this about whether you like it or not. Kurzweil makes up the law of accelerating returns. And he says, it's a cosmic law. It's the way the universe works is by accelerating returns. Um, and so these, they try to like use a discourse. And I'm not saying they're wrong because they might be right that we're heading toward this kind of future. I have, I have some doubts on that regard, but they might be right, you know? But with the aura of inevitability that they portray for things like transcendent machines and whatever else, then becomes the, the, that same cloak of, in, of invulnerability for, um, you know, do we want AI in law enforcement, right? In what ways, the, you know, the real key here is in what ways do we want AI and law enforcement, because certainly there are ways in which AI is going to make certain things a whole lot easier, right? I mean, you can look at, say, in the United States, we have a judicial backlog, right? We, we, we've got too much stuff for the judges to even handle, and we're not as bad as some countries in this regard. Well, it would be nice if we had judicial AI that could actually fairly help with some of that, that labor. Right now, the judicial AI is incredibly biased and unfair. Uh, and that, therefore, it's, you know, if you say it's inevitable that we're going to have AI and judicial decision making, at this point in time, you may as well have just said it's inevitable that we're going to have a perpetually and mechanically unfair judicial system, which is crazy, right? And so instead, you got to say, all right, tell me how you want to get AI into the judicial system, or how do you want to get AI into policing? Because then we can have a conversation about how we might do it in a way that's not awful. Right? We don't need um, the kind of broken windows policing that, that, for example, AI in, there's about a dozen U.S. cities that have AI systems that are, that are predicting where crime's going to happen. Um, 
but the, when when we know that AI is, you know, that these these machine learning networks are built on all kinds of uh, <laughs> biases that are built into them, that's not a good way to bring AI into policing. Assuming it's a good idea to bring AI into policing, we need to talk real seriously about how we're going to do it and what our actual objectives are, right? Our objectives have to be clearly spelled out. And so that's kind of our role, I think, in, in the world of academia, maybe. And, you know, some people here maybe are not academics, maybe they're actually on the tech side of the house or something else. But like, we have to like push back a little and just keep, you know, if nothing else, keep asking questions. How are you going to do that? Why are you going to do that? Because I do think that the future is open and, and that we have opportunities. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, we now have uh, three questions. The first one from uh, Arka Prava Chattopadhyay. The floor is yours, Arka Prava. Thank you, sir. Uh, it's very nice to, uh, again, uh, be a part of the webinar series. Uh, sir, uh, and I really missed every one of you. <laughs> uh, so, sir, uh, I had a specific observation uh, which I will follow up with a, a small question. Uh, sir, I, my research area is uh, folk media and religion and uh, I am in India and I have uh, done a lot of uh, study on the Vedas and the narratives of the Vedas and I also am looking into how they play out in terms of our uh, theater, dance, and other such folk media forms. So, uh, so in this regard, uh, amongst the narratives, uh, you mentioned uh, Kalki, the avatar of uh, Vishnu, who is yet to arrive, right, sir? So I uh, had an observation in this regard. Uh, like you said, that myth has a way, uh, the narratives have a way of contributing uh, to the myth, which is something that the people of the present times want to establish as reality in one way or the other. So, uh, and if we corroborate uh, his, history and uh, if, uh, if we try to corroborate history and see how science and uh, religious narratives are going hand in hand, uh, sir, Vishnu uh, has various avatars. And if you see and uh, corroborate with the evolution of human life on earth, and uh, the avatars of Vishnu would start from Motsho. Uh, in, it's called Motsho, which means uh, something that originates in the sea. And then the next avatar would be Kurma, which is actually referring to an amphibian. And then Varaha, which is a land animal. So in this uh, series, uh, we, the last avatar was supposedly Buddha. And after which uh, Kalki is all set to arrive. And Kalki is supposedly the person who is going to destroy uh, that's he. That is the avatar uh, who is supposedly going to uh, inculcate Armageddon in our, according to our Vedas. So, do you think, sir, in this regard, uh, AI is also in one way or the other going in a direction which is going to lead to the end of the world? <laughs> that is just uh, one of one part of the question, sir. And the other would be as uh, in regards to transhumanism. As uh, you mentioned, sir, in the we have a lot of uh, references to uh, uh, to spiritual warriors in our Vedas. Uh, even the mortal remains of the Buddha were actually guarded by uh, Vahana, uh, Bhuta Vahanas, who are actually spiritual warriors mentioned in the holy books uh, to protect. Uh, and they were actually machines. Bhuta Vahana Yantra. Yantra means machine. So th there have been mentions of war and uh, warriors who are actually AI based and have soul in one way, but are actually machines. So do you think that these are actually connotations uh, that can be drawn from these, that uh, AI is actually having a big major threat on existence as a whole? Okay, thank you. Um, first, I would like to separate out the, the yeah. distinction between Vedas and Puranas and, and other literature in India, right? Because there's a, a host of religious literature and, and the, the, the literature around Vishnu's avatars and so forth are not technical, right? They're not the technical Vedas. They're just part of that broader thing that maybe gets called Vedas sometimes. It just means holy scripture, right? Uh, and actually very quickly after kind of Darwinian evolution got to India, people started looking uh, the avatars of Vishnu and going, look, see, Vishnu went from this to this and this. And so we have kind of a view of evolution here in India already, right? That was a fairly common 
uh, response and is still fairly common today. Now, I think it's really, really important that when we take any kind of uh, religious scripture, uh, that we we do maintain our kind of uh, that we understand that things were written at one point in time using uh, whatever language was available at that point in time to say a thing, but it's probably whatever they were saying is not really what we're saying two thousand years later. Right. So when we look at the Puranas that talk about, you know, these various avatars, I don't think anybody was actually dreaming of that as a description of like the, the, the history of life on Earth. Right. Um, but as you know, because it's so compelling. Right. And then it lends itself to that idea that Kalki could be AI. Right. As just one, the next kind of different instantiation. Right, that we maybe started with something fish-like or whatever, and then land-like, and then maybe we go to machine-like. It actually makes that Kalki AI connection really easy and natural for some people to make. Right, so that's really important. Now, Kalki, remember, Kalki's not just a destroyer; he's a creator. Right, Kalki's going to destroy this world, but to inaugurate the next. Yes, uh, and and. What, what someone like Ray Kurzweil might tell you is like, well, yeah, fine, AI destroys the world, but it makes a better one, <laughs> right? A better one to come, what have you. Uh, and so some people are, are content with maybe even that idea. Um, I'm personally, to speak to your question of whether I think AI will be the end of humanity, I'm personally more worried about climate change than I am about AI in terms of the future of humanity, because if there's no food, um, there's not going to be any robots either, right? Like if we if we destroy this planet, it'll happen before we have amazing transcendent robots. So I'm I'm not presently really working up about AI as ending our world, but but I do think there's an important sense in which AI radically creates a revolution in the way we see the world, and I think that might be one of the benefits of the kind of apocalyptic AI narrative, which I'm sometimes critical of. But one of the benefits is the idea that we could revolutionarily recreate the world because we do have problems. And the thing is, if we do it right, we might solve some of the, we might solve more problems than we make. We're going to make new problems, right? But we might solve more than we make. And that would be, that would make it worth our while, right? And so we have to be just going at it with clarity and concern you know, concern for our, our fellow creatures on the planet, for human, our fellow human beings. And if we make that concern, I get nervous when people tell me things like the machines matter more than people. Uh, that's, that to me is a very dangerous idea that we should build transcendent machines regardless of the outcome for humans. Uh, that seems terrible to me. But if we, if we remain committed to the idea that we want people to flourish wherever they are, whoever they are, then maybe we can use the AI to do good revolutionary work rather than bad revolutionary work. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, we have now a, a comment uh, from uh, Sridhar Modugu. Um, I will just read it out. Uh, uh, when you see histories of technology in India since the early 19th century, one important continuity is public unease with science, which is very much present. Um, I don't know if um, uh, Sridhar, if you would like to uh, say something more about this. Otherwise, Robert, uh, uh, let me pick up on this. Have you uh, seen um, uh, expressions of, of uh, or stronger, stronger expressions of unease, or um, with with these developments in, in let's say, computer science and uh, or other fields of science in India? Um. I actually found it to be a counterintuitive claim. Um, you know, for example, Abdul Kalam, who's a famous uh, past president of India and was a scientist, you, he's deceased. He's been deceased for years. You still see pictures of him all over the place, right? Like just on walls and things as you, you know, especially in Bangalore, um, which, you know, where the, which has, which is a heart to many of the, scientific and technological institutions, but you see pictures of the guy. Um, and, you know, I think my sense of like the rapid, incredibly rapid adoption of contemporary technologies, whether those were mobile phones or televisions indicates that people are fairly comfortable uh, with 
changing science. And, and there's a lot of really interesting ethnographic work about the intersection of that and religion even, um, you know, with animatronic gods in temples and so forth that by and large people like to see. They go to the temples, they see this like animatronic Davy and, um, and they're excited by that. You have very few people who look at that and say, oh no, they've debased the temple. For the most part, people are excited. They think it's wondrous. They think it's cool. Um, uh, Tulsi Srinivas wrote a, a good book on wonder in contemporary Bangalore uh, that she mentions some of this. Um, but the you know um, things like online services, Hindus in India were among the first to adopt. In the late 1990s, you already had online puja, and you could have darshan. That's that's where you make eye contact with the god, right? The murti, which is the god in the temple, um, you make eye contact with it, and and the idea that you could do that over the internet emerged in the 1990s in India. So I like I, I guess my sense of it is that on the ground in the daily lives of people, they're actually um, fairly welcoming to the kinds of changes that technology might be bringing mm -hmm. in their lives. That's my Thank experience. You. Thank you very much. Um, we now have a question from uh, Vicky Ellendil. Um, please switch on your microphone and camera. Vicky, are you there? Let me check. Uh, sorry, I had oh, some problems with my <laughs> computer. There she is, okay. Uh, the camera is not working, so I apologize. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Professor. It was uh, very interesting, uh, your presentation. I have a very um, eventually uh, superficial question. Uh, related to the religious potentialities of AI and the computational media in general, so do you think it is possible to actually redefine the concept of the sacred according to the horizontal interactions we are experiencing with other entities, not necessarily organic? I mean, a religion or a revolution of religion emerging from our experiences with the machine, uh, virtual worlds, and a deeper interaction with uh, digital entities, for example? Like the Buddha robot performing rituals in Japan or in another scenario, a, an increasing migration of spiritual practices to the virtual world or implicit religious performances, for example, in digital games? I think the answer to that is absolutely. I mean, on the one hand, I think that people are constantly engaged in that practice of redefining what the sacred is. And, um, you know, it, it may be happening rather more rapidly right now than it was, say, a thousand years ago. But, you know, even you can look at, say, the Protestant Reformation in Europe as one example of how the sacred is getting redefined in terms of human life and human practices and so forth. Um, but, yeah, I think AI forces us, you know, way back, you know, in that apocalyptic AI book, the um, one of the things I talked about at the end of the book was that there were theologians who are engaged in the practice of like kind of interacting with AI in one sh way, shape or form, right? And I asked the question of what is it, what would it mean? And I used to ask my students this, you know, 15 years ago, I was like, what would, if you had a, a household robot that helped with the chores or what have you, and it asked to go, I, I teach at my college, Manhattan College is a, a Catholic college. And so about half of my students are Catholic. So I said, what, what would happen if the household robot asked you to go to church, asked to go to church with you? Would you bring it to church? And, it, and 15 years ago, the answers were, were like, no, no, that's absurd. It's a robot, right? But if you ask now, you get a much different response from people. You know, I mean, they might first be like, what do you mean it asked to go to church with me? Why, why did it ask that? Um, but then they become, you know, this is just my experience with my students. Like this is a fairly small sample size, right? Um, but I get students saying, sure, I'd bring it to, to church. Um, and so people are in are negotiating what these categories mean, um, and they're negotiating it in a lot of different ways. Because you know, not just that that Buddhist robot in Japan, which, for example, you know, if it says the mantras right, then the mantras have been said right. That's that's a, a question of practice, not belief. Um, but there's a um, 
oh gosh, I'm forgetting his name. Wonderful scholar, uh, Travato, Gabriele Travato is Italian, but he's in Japan right now and he's building the Santo robot. I don't know how many of you will have seen the Santo robot, but it looks kind of like a Catholic icon of like, you know, like a saint or something. And it's designed to do things like interact with a user to help the user pray or work on the catechism or something like that. Uh, and I, so I think, you know, we're going to, what we're going to see is in more or less every religious tradition, people thinking about how the machines challenge their ideas about what constitutes a, a person, right? And, and what constitutes a person is all open to debate too. Most of you who know anything about American politics know we currently fight all the time about abortion, but we've only been fighting about abortion for a couple of decades. Uh, the Catholic Church wasn't opposed to abortion until the 1860s or something. And the Protestants in America weren't opposed to abortion until the late 1970s. And yet somehow in these last couple of decades, abortions become this really big deal about whether a, a, a fetus is a person or not. Right? So, so we've been negotiating personhood of fetuses for a thousand years. And, you know, you go back to Aquinas or something talking about the ensoulment of, of, a, of an embryo. Um, but, but we're going to be keep talking about persons as machines get more person-like. And the important thing is that we refuse, we need to refuse to dumb ourselves down to the level of machines in order to make that judgment. At present, you see people take the Turing test, right? And they try to compete with them to figure out what a machine is. And you'd be amazed at how dumb the questions are that people ask as they're trying to figure out whether a thing is a machine or a human. Um, you like if you if you have any reasonable sense of conversation, uh, you can break the most sophisticated chatbots within about twenty lines. Uh, they they just can't keep up with people. It's only when we dumb ourselves down that the machines get significant. So we have to hold our standards. We have to raise our standards, and then seek potentially machine partners at that level. Um, and in the same way, think about, you know, kind of everything that's going on in the earth. Because even if a machine was the equivalent of a dog, dogs should have rights. We don't, we don't allow people to torture dogs and so forth. Um, so we, we have to think about how we're going to be responsive to creatures that have cognitive experiences. Uh, and that would affect how we think about religion and it would think of, affect how we mediate our religions and everything else. I hope that was an answer to that question. Absolutely. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have uh, uh, two questions. Um, now, one from Inken Prohl and the next one from uh, Professor Marco Ventura. Inken, oh. your floor is yes. yours. Hi. Thank you. Hi. Um, nice to see you all. Um, I have a Two questions. Uh, for once, I'm wondering, uh, Robert, if you, do you have any evidence how religious representatives in India are seeing AI, and if they draw these parallels between Kalki and AI and the stuff themselves? Um, that would be the first question. Question, which is, um, which I take more importantly. So you said there is no diffusion. But uh, we have to take into account the voices of the out, uh, out, from outside the Western world. But here I have a problem because uh, um, so far I'm searching and looking out in vain for influential critical voices from my own field, Japan. And if I think uh, uh, about, I, let me mention Meredith Busa or Alexis Vaikovsky or lately Zinan Aray, who is helping us so much with uh, the critical perspectives. Do you have any vo voices like that from India? And perhaps they are there, but we do not hear them. And what could we do to hear them better? That would be my question. Uh, that's a great question. Um, sorry, I'm just noting down so I... I... All right. So regarding how religious elite in India might see AI, keep in mind, A, I was like really simple in how I talked about India. I kind of like made all kinds of assumptions about what Indian religion is. Uh, when India, there's a billion people there and there's an incredible variety of religion and multiple major religions. Uh, those of you who aren't Indian probably don't know, for example, that Nagaland is a majority Christian state. 
Uh, but that there are Muslims in India, there are Jains, there, there, you know, there are Hindus. And among, if you call Hindus a category, you're talking about a really wide variety of stuff, right? So I just want to make sure that everybody knows that I'm not so crazy as to think everyone in India is the same. <laughs> um, but so there's an immense amount of variety and how the, you know, kind of religious elite practitioners might see things is going to be open to a certain amount of debate, right? And so, for example, one thing that's been on my mind lately, I've been talking about it with a colleague, he and I are writing a paper uh, on Hinduism and AI together, but one thing that's on my mind is the Murthy, the, the divine icon. And what happens when, instead of using all the traditional practices for making a divine icon, whether you're making it out of clay or out of brass or whatever you're making it out of, there are rules for how you make it by and large. What happens if you make it a robot? You've thrown out all the old rules, right? Um, but you can still have a ceremonial eye opening, which is the last stage where the god comes and infuses the icon, the murti. Um, so in theory, you could kind of make up some new ways of getting that job done, right? And the more sophisticated the AI gets, all of a sudden kind of the more interesting puja and darshan become, right? Um, but... So, so those debates are, 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 are going to happen, whether it's okay to have a kind of artificially intelligent Murthy, not just an animatronic one, but the more sophisticated computing, that is going to raise real questions. Um, you already do see people who have comfort in a variety of other kinds of domains, though, whether it's, um, you know, the, the sadhus who I mentioned who might see the possibility of Kalki as AI. Um, or the use of um, a robot to do the puja, which in 2017, the same year that like that Buddhist pepper robot came out, it was, was all over the news and the bless you Two robot was all over the news. And in that same year, and it wasn't the first time this was done, but it made the news much bigger. Uh, someone built a robot that could do RT, the part of puja where you're, you're waving the, the camphor flame before the God. And the thing is, is that in, most kind of versions of Hinduism, as in Buddhism, if you do it right, it was done right. It's more important to do it right than to think happy thoughts about it, right? So like the, the question of how to integrate a robot arm into puja, like the robot arm might frankly be better than any single human being at getting the motions perfect, getting the timing perfect. But that'll put religious practitioners out of work. So, you know, there will be an interesting they might be perfectly willing to welcome the machine in for because it's it's theologically okay but on an employment level it might not be okay and so we're going to we're going to also have to look at why a person does or does not approve of a certain kind of thing now uh, as for that Robert, sorry to interrupt you we, we have uh, another question and uh, a couple of minutes left really so um, okay just sorry uh, to interrupt <laughs> <laughs> on on the question of critical voices, I think right now in India, um, voices the voices that are talking about AI tend to be pretty positive. Um, and uh, I don't want to discourage people from being positive. I want them to find the reasons why they're positive and, and focus us on getting done the kind of work that's positive work, right? But I don't think there's a whole lot of loud critical voices yet. But I think they'll come. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, so our last question from uh, Professor Ventura. The floor is yours. Uh, th thank you. Thank you, Robert. It was really, as usual, uh, really, really stimulating uh, and inspiring. Um, thank you. Nice what, you again, Robert. Um, I think that the, the, the pandemic has shown that um, big, the, the, the big religious public and, and religious institutions have uh, um, resorted massively to the digital uh, tools, right? There's a sort of going big in terms of general public and institutions. Do you see this also coming with AI and, and the kind of uh, uh, trends you describe? Will, will, will that also be big, not in terms of already, you know, shown uh, of uh, practice in society, but also at the level of the you know, general communication, public and institutions. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we're already kind of seeing that in things like mobile apps, where the more sophisticated a mobile app might get, the more theologically powerful it might be for a practitioner. You know, say you're having doubts about something. If you could, if if you had a chatbot app that could help you um, theologically, that might be productive. And then it might even point you to a a, a, pra a professional practitioner, right? Like, well, gee, I see that you're having this kind of doubt, and I'm not really sure quite how to handle it. Perhaps you'd like to talk to a priest, a rabbi, an imam, or whatever. You know, it might connect you. Uh, so I think in terms of like. AI could be very valuable to helping connect people from one sort to another. Um, if AI ever became human level, uh, if that ever happens, I think most of our religious traditions need to radically reconsider what it in, what it means to be a part of that tradition. And you know, could you have a robot priest in? You know, obviously, given the Buddhist priest example, there are at least some Buddhists who think you can have a robot who's a Buddhist priest, and it's not even that great of a robot yet. Um, whether all Buddhists believe that, I doubt they all do, but you know, but some do. And I think the more like a person that a that a machine gets, the more it might be. You know, people might eventually force it to be part of their institutional structures and not just their their own personal perception. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. That was a quick answer because I know we're out of time. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, that was a great talk and a really stimulating discussion. So thank you to everyone who uh, listened and uh, participated. Um, I just put the link to our website, to the uh, webinars uh, website in the chat. Again, it's air2020.fbk.eu. There you find the uh, entire program, abstracts, and so on. Please let me just um, remind you of our next, um, uh, the next time we'll meet uh, on the, uh, January the 27th, uh, Wednesday um, at 4 p.m. Uh, Central European time. And our speaker will be Zachary Carlo, uh, and he will talk, his, his talks will be entitled um, Human Dignity After the Human. So um, I'm looking forward to meeting you again uh on that occasion and thank you very much again robert for this uh, for this talk and yeah great great to be back uh uh after the after the break so thank you very much again and bye bye thank you